This is the Friday, September 11, 2020 version of the Market Plus segment. Joining us now, Dan Huber in this week's installment of Mr. Huber's Neighborhood. Now, for clients of yours, Dan, and you get your newsletter, you do enlighten us with certain sure. themes. One of them was about Mr. Huber's Neighborhood. It, it, at least it felt like that. Um, you right, also wrote right. about the word of Gov I, this week. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. There's a group of people that think the word of Gov is too weighted. And then there's some who say, well, that's all we have. Where do you sit on that? Well, you know, first I had to know we were going to bring this up. I would have put my cardigan on oh, just okay. to, to set the mode. You but, don't have uh, a cardigan but, underneath yeah. there? But, but anyway. Okay. Yeah, no, I not today. Now, okay. usually I do. You, you do, I know. Especially when you get story time. Yeah. Yeah, yes. Uh, you know, I, you know, and certainly a difficult question. I mean, we all have been uh, become disgruntled with uh, some of the numbers that come out of the USDA from time and again. Uh, you, you know, that said, uh, yeah, I always kind of go back to the origins of why we have crop reports. I mean, and this was really something started by Abraham Lincoln uh, for the sole purpose of gathering crop data because farmers really had little access to it. And it, uh, you know, and again, the, the, the large, or let's just say the, the, the grain industry, the, the livestock industry at the time had better information. And this was a way to try to provide better information at the ground level. And yes, there's some, there's some problems. The, um, I, I think one of the challenges that the USDA has confronted is they're asked to do more every year with less dollars. So they're shifting and relying more and more on statistical analysis, statistical background, you know, which it has a, which has a purpose, but you know it will never truly replace boots on the field, really doing crop surveys and that type of thing. So now, granted, one of these days we're going to have the technology to the point to where satellite is going to give us all the answers you know we uh, we could ever really want to have coming out of the field. Until we reach that point, we have an imperfect system, but I still think because it is unbiased. Uh, and yes, over the years, you hear all these uh, these uh, conspiracy type stories and they're colluding to keep the price of uh, food products low. And if anybody, I, you know, I, I don't know if you've ever done it. I went out on the uh, USDA uh, lockdown a number of years ago. And, you know, it's, uh, you know, the, the idea is that they're actually in there conspiring to try to manipulate these numbers. I think uh, you, 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 for, you soon soon pick up that, no, that's not the case. They're doing the best they can with the tools they have. Yeah, yeah. that is that is a, a theory that's out there. And st instead of the uh, politics of that, let's ask about the presidential election. Oh, wait, sorry, that's in Market Plus Plus. Uh, let's start questions here right, that we uh, received via Twitter. Uh, Dave is asking us, with no carry in the bean market, how would you market the 2020 bean crop? Well, you know, the, I mean, of course, to keep in mind, it is no carry. We have less carry than, uh, you know, we necessarily thought about. But 450 million bushels of beans is by no, no means a, a tight carry out. If we were talking 100 million bushels of beans, you know, then we have a completely different story there. You know, I, when I look at that nine, uh, the 2021 uh, November bean right now, we're pushing the 950 area. You know, that's really a, uh, for many, a $9 cash coming out of the field. I, mean, I really think it's time to probably step up and go ahead and get some, some beans on the books. You know, not that you want to go hog wild by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, you know, one of the big caveats there is we still don't know what's going to happen in South America this year, which could could change the entire pictures, picture as we look out over the next three to five months. But uh, but still, one in the hands worth two in the bush. So I think a nine dollar bean is uh, with an average yield is uh, is worth taking a hold of at this point in time. All right, that's Dave's question. Uh, I, I, we did kind of get Brent's question in Oklahoma. He was asking about feeder cattle. We'll just kind of quickly highlight it again sure. if we could. What has really been pressuring feeder sure. cattle? Box beef sales, he says, are still strong. I mean, we did rise, but there is always still that pressure on the market. Oh, sure. Well, you know, this is the time of the year where I think seasonally we tend to see the feeder cattle market uh, set back a little bit because we know uh, feeders are going to come off a of pasture. They're going to move into feedlots. Uh, plus, in that, that two-week period where we saw this little setback in the feed, I shouldn't call it little, but the setback in the feeder cattle market very much coincided with the rally in the grains. Psychologically, that probably worked against the uh, the feeder cattle market as well. Right now, it looks like we've probably weathered most of that, and are, are, technically we're oversold. So I think we've got room to it to bounce back here again. You know, beyond that, though, boy, I, I just don't know if we can sustain the demand for the beef market into the winter months. 
So uh, that usually can be a little more difficult time to, uh, to try to look at any of the cattle markets moving much higher. Well, there is a theory of those that didn't have power for a, a few days uh, through the duration. They're having to restock, but that's not going to be enough to eat through a demand. But I do have another weather question. This no, one right. is about frost. I mean, it was okay. raining in certain parts, but Bradley in Upland, Nebraska, was asking about where, what's going to be the yield impact of frost damage. It wasn't nearly as widespread as maybe forecast, but it still had an impact. Sure. You know, certainly a, a local impact. You know, uh, anybody who's been through frost and handles physical products realize it becomes usually more of a quality issue uh, than a major volume issue. So I think in those areas impacted, uh, yes, it's going to be a mess and you're going to have some off-grade grain that you're going to have to take care of. When it comes to the overall 15 billion bushels per se of corn and 4 billion bushels of beans we're producing in the country, I, I think the, the effect is probably going to be somewhat neg negligible. And that would be kind of similar to what some of the acres were. I mean, when we had that August USDA report, which is kind of like Sharanda in Centerville, Missouri's question, asking about we had sure. uh, reports of all these record-breaking harvests in, in, uh, mm -hmm. in corn, soybeans, cotton, and spring wheat. But then we had flooding and high sure. wind damage and drought. So, I mean, this is right. – weather has changed this story dramatically, but it's not the only story oh, here oh, in 2020. Right, right. Uh, well, I mean, certainly demand is the other part of that equation that we don't forget about. And of course, the, uh, the 800 pound gorilla in the room there is China. And, you know, without them, you know, we'd, we'd be questioning where the demand is. But boy, they have just been on an insatiable demand here for corn and soybeans both. And for all intents and purposes, it looks like that will continue. So, but to truly coming back to what, what you just mentioned, the, uh, the the event that really changed the whole picture psychologically, even more so the demand, were those storms that it hit Iowa so hard. And, and realistically, I mean, it, we don't know the total impact, I guess, just yet until we get the combines harvested or combines rolling. But, you know, there's been estimates of anywhere from 300 million to 600 million uh, drop in production, which is substantial. I mean, that, that really changed the corn market from what potentially could have been a, a rather negative outlook into one that is, at, at, at worst, uh, neutral compared to last year. Yeah, it, it wasn't just Iowa. I mean, we're talking 700 miles, that storm and what it cost oh, and the oh, damage absolutely. in the towns. And yeah. uh, it was a big thing. I, and I mean, we, we were very... Yeah, you yeah. were fortunate there where you were at. I want to finish, We though. were fortunate here, right, yeah. right. Okay. I want to finish with South America from our friend in Canada. Phil in Dresden, Ontario, mm -hmm. sure. is asking us sure. about with renewed U.S. soybean buying from China, the 800-pound gorilla as you refer to it, and a big move in world mm -hmm. vegetable oils and soybean meal will, quote, beans in the teens, end quote, get back into the conversation in 2021, depending on what happens in Brazil. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, I would say you keep in mind that, you know, we have had a, uh, a quite a move in the oil markets, uh, as Phil was pointing out there. And of course, a lot of that was stimulated by COVID uh, shut down of the plantations in Indonesia. And so we were just were not putting the, the palm oil out, which led to a, a pretty strong demand for the bean oil products. But, you know, yes, China has finally moved over. I mean, have been some very substantial buyers from us. I mean, we were very competitive that made that uh, that made that work. But looking forward, even on the reports here today, the USDA bumped the Brazilian estimate up to 126, 136, I guess, million metric tons. You know, another record uh, crop out of Brazil. And the world is really has that factored in and is counting on that happening at this point. And, and as we have already heard in the weather forecast, we have a La Nina forming. There is, we don't know how intense that's going to become, but there is a some historical precedence that with La Nina's, you end up with uh, less than ideal weather conditions in the uh, southern hemisphere. So, uh, yes, I mean, I, I think that will keep uh, markets certainly uh, cautious as, as far as trying to get too bearish. Uh, getting beans in the teens, you know, we're going to have to have some real problems down there for that to happen. But, you know, there is uh, right now the, uh, the question mark is where is the risk? The risk is for growing that next crop. Well, I believe the questions back in July were could we get back to $10? And we're knocking on the door. We're three we quarters are. of a cent from there. All right. Dan Huber, good to right. see you. Next time, bring the cardigan. Likewise. <laughs> we'll do. Thanks. All right. Thanks, Dan. Uh, next week, we'll look at dredging efforts on the lower Mississippi River. And Tom Fitzenmeyer will join us to analyze the markets.
For all of us here at the television show Market to Market, I'm Paul Yeager. Thank you so very much for watching, listening, or reading. Have a great week.